What actually is geopolitics? This is going to be a very complex video. Geopolitics and geostrategy are the foundation of every country's action. Knowing and understanding why a nation moves a certain way gives you a significant advantage over your opponent. In peace just as much as in war times. Miscalculations, however, will lead to guaranteed failure and will cost you dearly. Lies mixed with truths and deceptions at the forefront of every foreign policy, almost like a game of chess. Therefore, it is also referred to as the Grand Chessboard. A term at first cited by Mr. Brzezinski, a US security advisor in his book about American primacy in the 21st century. Now after researching certain foreign policies for more than a decade, I can guarantee you that some states never really had peaceful intentions. In fact, some things are by design. As the 32nd president of the United States already said, in politics, nothing happens by accident. If it happens, you can bet it was planned that way. Franklin D. Roosevelt Now before we even attempt to map the world, we actually need to define what geopolitics is. Since there is no clear definition of a term, just a broad general consensus, I personally would define it as a focus on political power linked to geographic space in correlation with diplomatic history and general intention. Or in simpler terms, resources plus intention equals geostrategy. What do they have, what do they want and how do they plan to achieve it? Sounds complex, don't worry I'm gonna walk you through everything. Let's start with number one. And at this point we note everything that a country has accumulated in terms of resources, economy, geography and recent history. Most assets come with a lot of pros and cons. Let's take the example of Japan. The islands of Japan are notoriously scarce in resources and therefore heavily reliant on raw materials since they entered the age of industrialization. To overcome the deficits, the Japanese empire went to war, just like almost every other nation on earth. After the defeat in World War II, it wouldn't be imperialism, but intelligence that would make the country thrive. Japan has one of the world's highest average IQs and found a way to export it. Imported resources are turned into valuable goods and then shipped into the world. The import value, add more to it and live off the deficit. If you would want to enforce your will onto Japan, you could interfere with trading or military isolate the island. This would ultimately lead to a collapse of the industry and eventually the society. Of course, the information that I'm giving you is nothing new. Japan has strong allies, valuable connections and the most capable military in Asia to prevent exactly this scenario. But just like Japan, every country has its natural weak spots that can be exploited and leveraged. Now to understand what the intention of the country is, we at first have to understand its people and its culture. In other words, what is their mindset? Only if we figure that out, you will be able to predict the next move. The beliefs of every nation are reflected in their leaders to a certain degree. No nation would accept a ruler that is inherently against their fundamental belief. The people of Saudi Arabia, which are strong advocates of Wahhabi Islam, would only accept a ruler who is just like them. When those two things do not align anymore, then the results can be observed in Iran for example. No king survives without his people, therefore any future move will be more easily predictable, if we take this rule into account. Which leads me to the third point. After countless horrible wars, humanity finally came to the conclusion that invading your neighbor is not necessarily the best option. The emphasis lies on not necessarily, because even though most nations have peaceful intentions and solely compete outside the battlefield, they sometimes let themselves drag into proxy wars. Yemen and Ukraine are two ongoing examples. And I haven't even touched on the subject of regime changes, blackmailing or other forms of diplomacy. Are you still here with me? I know, boring theory, but now that we've got the basics, I can talk about the real complex things. Now that we've assembled the points, we finally can start to map the world. But keep in mind, this is my personal observation, you might get to a different conclusion. So feel free to add your opinion in the comments. The national interest is predetermined by geopolitics or the history of a country. Important political leaders never just followed their interests. They were concerned about the interests of their people. Joseph Nye Right now there are three major superpowers that fight for world supremacy. These are the US, Russia and China. What they all have in common is vast amounts of resources and a capable economy. Therefore they make enough cash to finance their endeavors. Then there are at least another two secondary superpowers that hold great influence. 
This would be India, which challenges Chinese influence in the Indo-Pacific region. And then there's the European Union as a collective. Regional powers are countries that have a great influence within the hemisphere, but are not powerful enough to expand their influence around the globe. What's left are the really small fish, developing countries that have neither financial power nor the resources and can be walked over easily. Most nations are officially independent, but only as long as they act in accordance with the overlord. A derogatory term that I often hear is the country's backyard, which was first used with the US Latin America policy. Even though it's actually not that wrong, it just really depends on the case. Personally, I would classify it either as an intervention, a form of neocolonialism, or even imperialism. Now what do those terms mean? Well, let me explain one by one. Use my case study for an intervention. During the Cold War, the Soviet Union always meddled in America's backyard. One of those cases was Chile. Salvador Allende became president of Chile in 1970. He was also a Marxist and a member of the Communist Party. He was also the first communist to become president by vote. Like every other nation that experienced this outstanding progressive alternative to liberty, it went down after not even three years. I think this is a new world record, despite the more than $100 million in aid from the Soviet Union. He became so unpopular that the Chilean truckers went on a strike for a month, which was just the first of many to come. Eventually, the CIA supported allies in the military, they overthrew him. The successor, Augusto Pinochet, even though he wasn't a saint, laid the foundation for a prosperous Chile in his 17 years of reign. Now it can be subject to debate how much the CIA really influenced the coup. Because remember what I said, no king survives without his people, or at least a strong minority. There would be no protest without unpopularity. Now let's get to the next one, New Colonialism. According to Wikipedia, New Colonialism is Proposed dominance of countries through culture and or economics. Here are some examples. In 1979, our beloved European Union negotiated an agreement with West African states over fishing rights off their coasts. Ten years down the road, local fishermen have lost 75% of their income and have to move out further into dangerous waters to even feed themselves. Yet we still maintain our presence there, in exchange for a couple of millions per year. Another thing would be the so-called, and I'm not kidding you, debt trap diplomacy. Institutions that pursue this kind of relationship are the IMF, the International Monetary Fund, the World Bank, and to an even greater extent, the Chinese government. The only difference is that China is quite blatant about it. While the other two at least pretend to care, but also are just an extension of Western foreign policy. Once they accept certain deals, they de facto lose a big chunk of their freedom. While China demands favors from their creditors in the form of military outposts or access to trading hubs like in Djibouti or Pakistan, the other two are a bit less upfront. I think I will quote John Ziegler at this point. The IMF is always prescribing the same reforms. Fiscal discipline, budget transparency, liquidation of public services, namely hospitals and schools must become profitable, and privatization of national resources and industries. Above all, care would be taken to ensure that no international speculator lost his original investment. The result would regularly be the impoverishment of the population. However, IMF employees would not take note of the consequences of their policies and be deaf to the cries of their victims. Most of them live in the elegant suburbs of Washington, have studied at American universities and are prisoners of the monetarist dogma taught there. The indigenous peasants, the outcasts, the beggars, the street children they perceive at most from behind the tinted windows of their government limousines, where they stay only for a few days in the affected countries in luxury hotels and meet only with selected leaders. And he definitely has a point there. I mean, who's buying all the privatized natural resources? I know for sure that nobody ever offered me an oil field or a coal mine. If I would have to take a guess, it is probably one of the multinational corporations that barely pay any taxes, but displace and destroy local communities. Loans can also be cancelled from one day to another. Just ask the Yugoslav Republic about the outcome. If there still would be one. This is also a form of neocolonialism, but one where no shots are fired and no disturbing images travel around the world. These are just the most common forms. I didn't even touch the subject of cultural destruction by media, language, religion or migration. The last stage would be imperialism, which is blatant war, followed by a puppet government, which happened in Iraq, Afghanistan and Kosovo. And this is how we exercise dominance over our countries. But what if there is a country in someone else's backyard, that refuses your generous offers, rejects your cultural enrichment and already has an overlord, but an invasion would be too costly. Well then there is still an option for a regime change. Regime change, such a bad word isn't it? No sane person will do that, some of you might say. And you are right, no, sane person, would pursue his goals regardless of the outcome. 
which leads us into a field of psychology. The human that doesn't care about his companions is the one that causes the most suffering, said one psychologist. And if there's one mental illness that absolutely fits the narrative, it is the psychopath. About 1% of the general population is psychopathic. Not a lot, you might add, until we do the math. In the US, a country with a population of 3300 million people, it would be 3.3 million psychos. Then we add the sociopaths on top, another 4%, and count in the narcissists, roughly another 5%. And we end up with 10% or 33 million dysfunctional characters. All of them have little to no empathy and solely care about one thing, and that is power. While some of them end up in prison, Others rush to the executive floor. CEO, police officer or civil servant are just three professions that attract the most psychos. They don't rob banks, they become bank executives. Robert T. Howe, criminal psychologist. Kind of ironic that he talks about banks, don't you think? Most people act as they please, only numbers and personal gain are their priority. Fellow human beings are just a means to an end. Water shouldn't be a human right, said the CEO that earned $7.7 .7 billion with bottled water. And of course, those people find their way into politics as well. If only one man dies of hunger, that is a tragedy. If millions die, that is only statistics. Humanitarianism is the expression of stupidity and cowardice. Now that we've established the capabilities of our leaders, we can now specify how they fool us. Usually people don't show up at your doorstep and commit unspeakable crimes. First of all, we have to do one thing, and that is to dehumanize you. Suddenly, you're not a human being anymore. We are a useless eater and not welcome anywhere. If you need a real life example of that, then the past two years were not quite fun, especially if you belong to a certain group, like me. As the one in charge, all you have to do is find those breaking points and divide society along those lines. Usually it's the same thing that humanity has fought over. Resources, race, ethnicity, origin, age, religion, gender, lifestyle, and your opinions are the most common ones. Start off by seeding dissatisfaction, create a culture of envy, impotence and prejudice, and blatant lies through false narratives. Then increase the hostility in your words. Your ultimate goal is to create a dialectic. It is us versus them. Only then you will be able to do the most unspeakable of things. Every nation in every region now has a decision to make. Either you are with us or you are with the terrorists. Either you're with us, either you love freedom and with nations which embrace freedom, or you're with the enemy. There's no in-between. You're either with us or you're with the enemy. That's, that's clear. I will continue to make that clear. Of course we people don't want war. Why should some poor slob on a farm want to risk his life in a war, when the best way he can get out of it is to come back to his farm in one piece? Neither in Russia, nor in England, nor for that matter in Germany, that is understood. But after all, it is the leaders of a country who determine the policy, and it is always a simple matter to drag the people along. Whether it is a democracy or a fascist dictatorship, or a parliament, or a communist dictatorship, voice or no voice, the people can always be brought to the bidding of the leaders. That is easy. All you have to do is to tell them that they are being attacked, and denounce the peacemakers for lack of patriotism, and exposing the country to danger. It works the same way in any country. Hermann Göring, German politician, military leader, and convicted war criminal. The fourth is said the media will gladly assist you with the rise to power. True journalists are just as rare as colored diamonds. The rest are just bootlickers, nothing more than paid propagandists. Let's see what the Nazis actually thought about propaganda, should we? What is the secret of propaganda? To indoctrinate the one whom propaganda wants to seize, completely with the ideas of propaganda, without him even realizing that he is being indoctrinated. Think of a press as a great keyboard on which the government can play. Propaganda works best when those who are being manipulated are confident that they are acting on their own free will. If you tell a lie big enough and keep repeating it, people will eventually come to believe it. The lie can be maintained only for such time as the state can shield the people from the political, economical and or military consequences of the lie. It thus becomes vitally important for the state to use all of its power to repress dissent for the truth is the mortal enemy of the lie, and thus by extension the truth is the greatest enemy of the state. Joseph Goebbels, Vice Minister of Propaganda.
Why do people even fall for those narratives? It is not just simply dissatisfaction, it is way deeper. Something that Carl Gustav Jung called the shadow. According to Jung, the shadow refers to the unconscious aspects of personality with which a person does not identify, but nevertheless carries within himself. The shadow contains everything that contradicts the positive, conscious self-image of a person and his social mass. They are unconscious or partially conscious in personality traits, behaviors or even feelings that one does not want to be or see. In simpler terms, all the characteristics and behaviors that you vehemently reject in other people, perhaps find downright repulsive, are also present inside you. It gets even worse. Both who embody all the traits that you reject are subject to hate. You can see those mechanisms in action when it comes to body positivity or certain women's liberation movements. In his Magnus Opum, The Psychology of the Masses, the French social psychologist Gustave Le Bon called this phenomenon a mass psychosis. A psychosis is an abnormal condition of the mind that results in difficulties determining what is real and what is not real. Symptoms may include delusions and hallucinations. On simpler terms, those people that dehumanize us are fighting collectively against an illusion that they feed, uphold and project onto others. The illusion of the evil patriarchy, just to name one. Double thing means the power of holding two contradictory beliefs in one's mind simultaneously and accepting both of them. George Orwell, 1984. Now why is it important to understand it? Because only those kinds of people would even attempt to carry an establishment or support the government. Hence we're saying one man's terrorist is another man's freedom fighter. Most revolutions don't even have a majority, we just come across as one. Never underestimate the power of people in large groups, regardless of their intelligence. Whoever can conquer the street will one day conquer the state. For every form of power politics and any dictatorship run state has its roots in the street. During the American Revolution, it was only about 2-5% of the total population that fought against the British and succeeded. The first Libyan civil war saw only 250,000 participants out of 7 million people. 3.57% of the total population. In the first Chechen war, just 6,000 fighters out of 1 million people fought against the Russians, which equals to 0.6%. The Ukrainian revolution of 2014, about 800,000 protesters in total, which comes down to just 1.6% of the total population. Now, I'm not saying that all of those leaders and dictators that were taken down were saints, that is definitely not the case. But it is a bittersweet symphony when I find articles that accuse American NGOs of training personnel and huge financial contributions. It gets even worse when you find out that the new leaders screw the whole country over. The achievements of Saakashvili are a great example. Education is dangerous. Every educated person is a future enemy. I already told you about the three superpowers, so let's map their predominance and allies. The US overshadows the world in terms of resources, inspiration and work ethic, but also through its countless institutions. NATO is the most powerful military alliance in the world, with 30 member states and counting. Aside from NATO, the US maintains relationships with major non-NATO allies. In South America it is Brazil, Argentina and Colombia. In the Pacific region it is New Zealand, Australia, the Philippines, South Korea, Thailand and Taiwan. Many of those countries would hate troops or host a garrison. From the Middle East to North Africa, there's Pakistan, Kuwait, Qatar, Israel, Saudi Arabia, UAE, Oman, Tunisia, Egypt and Morocco. Currently, there are 19 major non-NATO allies. India, Georgia, Sweden, Finland and Ukraine could also become a part of that list. 49 military alliances and around 600 military installations are scattered across half of the globe. But Russia is not sleeping, it is still one of the greatest powers in the world and rejects Western expansion and ideology. Therefore, it is maintaining countless relations with other countries as well. In the Eastern Hemisphere, we have the so-called Ruski Mir, literally translated as Russian world. Ruski Mir is a content that comprises the culture of Russia and its interaction with traditions, history and the diaspora. The Eastern counterpart to NATO would be the Collective Security Treaty Organization or CSO, containing Armenia, Belarus, Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, Russia and Tajikistan. The CSO is solely a defensive military alliance. Most of our states are also members of the Eurasian Economic Zone. A trade alliance that also constantly seeks new members. While Central Asia is on good terms with Russia, former European nations have a different opinion. Most of them joined the Western Hemisphere and almost expect an open conflict. China is on a meteoric economic rise, at least before the common cold, but until now it is still the workbench of the world. 
With more and more economic success came the cash, and the Communist Party went on a shopping spree. Military and trading ports are being bought or built as a part of a Silk Road initiative. China's predominance ranges all over the Indo-Pacific region, especially over the weaker countries, which is visible for territorial claims. Cyber warfare and espionage are the cherry on top. Africa plays a special role due to its position in history. The continent was, and to a certain extent, is still going through an era of neocolonialism, where debt trap diplomacy, former colonial masters, religious proxy wars, and multinational corporations are dividing the country and its resources among themselves. Unfortunately, it is not that innocent about the situation. Widespread corruption and civil wars are part of the problem. Questo si chiama Franco CFA. È la moneta coloniale che la Francia stampa per 14 nazioni africane, alla quale applica, alle quali applica il signoraggio e in forza delle quali sfrutta le risorse di questa nazione. Questo Questo è un bambino che lavora in una miniera d'oro in Burkina Faso. Il Burkina Faso è una delle nazioni più povere del mondo. Per il Burkina Faso che ha l'oro, la Francia stampa moneta coloniale. In cambio pretende che finiscano nelle casse del tesoro francese il 50% di tutto quello che il Burkina Faso esporta. L'oro che questo bambino si infila in un cunicolo per tirare fuori finisce per lo più nelle casse dello Stato francese. Allora la soluzione non è prendere gli africani e spostarli in Europa, la soluzione è liberare l'Africa da certi europei che la sfruttano e consentire a queste persone di vivere di quello che hanno. Geopolitics is all about leverage. We cannot make ourselves safer abroad unless we change our behavior at home. And talking about problems, if we look at the world map, then you already might have guessed that the vast variety of interests could cause bloodshed, and to that I say you're totally right. One wrong move could trigger a butterfly effect. Just like volcanoes that can only erupt along the continental plates, the three different hemispheres cause conflict along their lines of interest, and everything in between is lighting up. Along the Chinese hemisphere that crushes into American influence, there's a whole series of potential conflicts. Taiwan, the South China Sea, the Korean Peninsula, and Japan are on the line. Then there are conflicts with India and its ally Bhutan. The Middle East is largely divided between the Western and Russian Hemisphere. There is a proxy war from Nigeria over North Africa to Pakistan between Saudi Arabia and Iran. And what has been described as another Cold War, the conflict is waged on multiple levels over geopolitical, economic and religious influence. All while Israel is fighting another separate Cold War against literally all of its Muslim neighbors. Literally all of them pursue their own interests, either by direct military intervention assassinations of financial contributions of terrorist groups and oppositions. And I don't want to go even into the civil wars in Syria, Iraq or Yemen, where everyone is pulling strings, or what feels like everyone is pulling strings. The West has been expanding and got closer to the Russian zone and is slowly chopping away former allies. Unfortunately, the war in Ukraine is the result of those policies. Overall, geopolitics is a very shady business and some people never really think about it or what could have been. Most of us never even question what is going on behind closed doors, which is one of the reasons why they can act as they please. One does not become enlightened by imagining figures of light, but by making darkness conscious. Gargoyles of Hume. Alright guys, that's it for today. Uh, thank you for watching my personal take on geopolitics. If you have something to share or questions, then just let me know in the comments. I know this topic might be complicated for some, so I might want to do a follow up if needed. I actually was intended to work on a different project, but as soon as I saw this comment, I thought that he might not be the only one. So I took some notes and just could stop writing anymore. And here we are. So shout out to you, mate. Well, that's it for today, and I hope to see you next time. Bye.